And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, hello, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce our guest, a man who has been part of MMA journalism, a guy who I personally believe one of the most intelligent journalists and experts out there, a guy that breaks down fights, breaks down situations, does an incredible job, has a incredible podcast with Brian Campbell. That's a hard thing to hold on to right there <laughs> when you're talking about that, but he's got morning, morning, morning combat. Great show. You need to listen to it. My man, Luke Thomas, how you doing, brother? Everything good? That is a very generous intro, Big John. Thank you for having me, Josh, as well. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm mostly okay. I'm living. I'm living. I'm living. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. John does the intros, and it seems like he gets the same response every single time. Man, that is a great intro. Thank you for doing doing me justice and all this. It's It actually is kind of nice, because I would have just said, hey, guys, welcome to the show, Luke Thomas. I would have just left it at that. No disrespect, but I mean, like, it's it's a little long-winded for me. I'm uh, long with it. Yeah, it, well, you know what? I'll take compliments where I can get them. Absolutely. So uh, don't, don't rain on my parade, Josh Thompson. <laughs> no, I will there not. There you go. I like I will, You must be married because I don't get compliments in my house either. So that's, <laughs> 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 that's how it works around here. Yeah, I understand oh, that. Man. Uh, hey, buddy, man. I know it's been a long time. You and I have been talking about trying to get you on. I talked to BC, too, when I worked the Floyd Mayweather fight with um, Masvidal and in that whole situation. Not Floyd, sorry. Nate Diaz and Masvidal fight. And... um. It w- it's just been like, I want to get Brian on, I want to get you guys, I want to get you both on, but I also felt like in this setting, four people on one thing could be a lot. It can and be, so, yeah. yeah. And so we were like, you know what, let's try to do one of, do one of them uh, one at a time, and that's exactly where we're at right now. But my man, I want to say thank you. I know we had a little hiccup this week. I was texting you back and forth. We said, okay, how about Tuesday? You're like, yeah, Tuesday works. And then we had approved already somebody else because I hadn't heard from you that day. Then I was like, Wednesday. And then John's like, I got to go out of town. So then I was like, okay, Thursday, dude, can we do this? Killed me. I'm sorry. And it's my fault. Luke. I appreciate no, it's... you being so uh, easy to work with, man. Thank I, you. I will say, uh, and you guys have probably experienced this, uh, you know, sometimes you book fighters for interviews and then they don't show. And then you're like, hey, I thought we were on for one. They're like, oh, I thought you meant one Pacific time. It's yeah. like you had written E.T. in there. ET, so yeah. I totally get it. I, I was, I was uh, delighted to be here and we made it work. That's the most uh... important part. It's always difficult, especially when you're dealing with fighters. But I know that the three of us are a little bit more professional than that. So we, we get, I finally got it together, I hope. I hope. Hey, bud. Um, then first, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the pay-per-view this weekend. And uh, obviously, there's been a lot of talk and buzz about the fact that Cleo Roundtree's got the power. He's got the power to potentially starch Alex. And if I'm looking at the betting odds, the betting odds don't suggest that at all. You know, when I look at some of these betting odds, it's talking about the odds being so much favorable to to Alex. And I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm just going to simply say Khalil's got the power. We know that. But does he have the ability and the technique to get to Alex's chin? Um, I mean, I'm I'm of the view that, like, you know what? Like, for example, you guys have been around long enough to notice this. Like, we're living in a different era now where guys are winning a few weight uh, or they'll, they'll win a weight class title. They'll defend once or twice. And then they've got their eyes that. set on going up a division. And we come from an era where that just didn't happen for a lot of different reasons. Guys would win and then just stand a post as long as they could for challenger after challenger. And what you found doing that, I think you guys might agree with this, is that sometimes like you would look around and it would be like, you know, what was one of Mighty Mouse's? He won it, but like what was one of his tougher fights? It was who was the the, the kid who came up uh, uh, down from uh, Tim, Tim Elliott down from thirty five? Yeah. Or you know, we live in a world where I remember exactly where I was when Matt Sarah got the win over GSP and yeah. it was like how could this even happen and I'm not suggesting to you like that is inevitable I'm not predicting one of those things but just that maintaining a weight class title is one of the most difficult things to do iteration after iteration because you, that is the biggest day of Khalil Roundtree's life and of course it's a big day for Alex Pereira but it's not the biggest fight he's been in not by a million miles and so any kind of small error with those gloves where a guy as you noted Big right hook, big left straight, big overhand left for Khalil Roundtree. He does plant. That's going to make him available to be targeted with leg kicks and front kicks and everything else. But, like, a little mistake. And, like, obviously anything can go up in smoke. So I agree with you that, like, you know, um, he, he's not much of a pursuer from the footwork standpoint. He doesn't cage cut in that way. He kind of lets the fight come to him a little bit. There is a little bit of evasive footwork. So, you know, just speaking about th- – this is what I always say. If Khalil Roundtree and Alex – 
uh, Pereira fought a hundred times, you might say, hey, you know, uh, Poton's going to win 80 to 90% of them. But that means there's going to be 10 to 20 times Mm -hmm. where Khalil Rountree would win. And it doesn't mean that's going to happen on the 81st fight or the 82nd fight. It could be the first time that they fight where it could be that case. So do I favor Poton? Of course, I favor Poton. But a big, strong, heavy-handed guy like Roundtree, if if Poetan's not really minding his P's and Q's, you just have to take the possibility of upset seriously. And I think on that level, I certainly give him a chance. BJ Penn, let me, used, let me ask you, B, can one second. You, BJ Penn used to say this: ahead. I don't have to be better than him every single day. I just got to be better just than him that, that night. night. That's it, and that's a huge that's deal. It. Go ahead, John. Sorry. Well, when you, when you talk about that fight, though, a lot of people have complained saying they don't believe the clear Roundtree. Oh. The UFC is making that fight. He doesn't deserve it. It should be Ankalaev. I don't agree with that. And, and the reason I don't agree with it is I, I look and I go, I, Ankalaev definitely could be put in that spot of you know being the challenger for it. But he was given that chance one time and it didn't really perform in a way that you go, wow, I really want to watch him again. I'm not saying he's not a great fighter. He is. But Khalil has put together a very nice win streak. He's fought everyone they put in front of him. And at least they know. The fight should be exciting, and I think there's going to be a knockout in it based upon the way both of these guys fight. I couldn't really disagree with that. I would add a a slightly different layer to it, which is that a lot of times, for the audience who doesn't know this, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, but that you know, just you have to really appreciate, especially with the UFC's calendar where they're just constantly pumping out shows. Yeah. They've got this show later on this month in the Middle East. Ankalaev is just going to be much more important for that uh, market, given his uh, he's, yep. he's Muslim, yeah. than than some other. You know, they could have put Cleo Roundtree there. It would have been a fine fight. But again, they're trying to play to their market with the with the people that they have. The point you also raise is certainly that like Ankalaev's had a couple of these, like the first Johnny Walker fight, then the 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 Blahovich fight, where it's like dude, what are you doing here? Like, this is not a disciplined way to fight on your part, or at least not, you know, it wasn't very thoughtful, certainly in the Blahovich. The thing I would add is that a lot of times fights get made, yes, who would be a good matchup? Does this guy deserve it? Blah, blah, blah. But also, like, we've got a calendar date we have to fill. Who is available? And then they just go down the list, and then they try to put a thing together. And so I think a big part of this is you couldn't headline this card with – uh, the women's fight in the co-main event. It's a fine fight to have, but it's not going to headline the card. Call up Poetan, get on the bat phone, and then figure <laughs> out who's around. And that's has honestly he, how a lot of this is done. Yeah. Dude, has he not been their superhero? Yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ. He Every time they call, he's, yeah, let's go. No, I he's, agree. He's, he's, he's Cowboy Cerrone. It, yeah, that's exactly what he is right now. You know, he, just he's at, at that level, though, where he'll fight anybody, anytime. And the talking conversation in terms of Uncle Lyaf, my take on the Uncle Live situation is that if you're not ready when they call, then they move on. They don't have time to sit here and say, hey, what about next time? Hey, what about how about in a week or two? They're not that's not their business model. It's never been their business model. I mean, they called me a couple of times and I was like, yeah, I'm dealing with this injury. I could probably in with like three weeks after that. They're like, OK, we're going to move on. And I sure I was like a little bit upset at the time because you're like, damn, that's a really big name I'd like to fight. That person needs to get fought because they're on a year-long contract that needs three fights within that year offered to them. They have a structure in which the promotion needs to run. And so understanding that is something that uh, fighters can't take personal. They're like, oh, Uncle Ives, like, hey, I'm ready to fight you. They're, they're saving you or they're trying to keep you from me. That's not the truth. It's probably the furthest thing from the truth. One of the most active fighters right now is uh, Poetan. And so you've got to make sure that you're keeping him happy and whoever you can keep in front of him. And I got to be honest. If Uncle Live had not said, he must have said no along the way, sometime, some way, hey, these are the dates. And I would agree with you. And I didn't agree with you until I saw your clip earlier today when I was doing some research on you, is that you basically said, putting him in Utah doesn't make sense. You're talking for, for what? I mean, yeah, for what? Like, <laughs> you're not going to get a, a big Mormon crowd out there. I don't, I don't even it. look at it that way, but, I, but I can that see your was point. a good, he brought it up, and I was like, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Like, totally point. slipped my mind. I didn't even think about that. And then you you hit it right on the head. Why would I put that fight together in Utah? I need this event. This event needs to happen. So let me put Khalil Roundtree in there. Both guys are knockout artists. Let's see what happens. Let's let the dust settle. And even if it, even if, um, even if Alex gets him out of there soon, you can see him, Alex, turning around and going, look, I'm 36 years old. Flip me around. Let's go. I want to turn around and do another fight here as soon as possible. That's his MO right now. 
I mean, you mentioned the Cowboy Cerrone thing. Like, I, I, I honestly believe that, you know, the UFC is looking for a lot of different things from their fighters. But arguably, if not the most important, certainly up there is, you, again, there's trains leaving the station all the time, right? Yeah. How much can you help make that a reality for them by being ready, by being present, by being active. Look at last week. We had UFC Paris. Hanato Moicano had an AC separation oh. in his shoulder. That was his third fight this year. How many guys get three fights in a calendar year in the UFC in 2024? Yeah. Not many. No. Not many. So he said yes. And the fact that he was able to win is like, you know, mind blowing. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that guy wasn't physically ready to fight, but he did it anyway. And it worked out in his particular case. But that's what they're looking for is guys who will say yes when the call comes so that they can stack a card, get it ready to go, ship it out the door, and then move on to the next one. True. Yeah, that, that's the. I feel like when you were talking about earlier about fighters are going to win one or two fights in their title division, and then they're going to try to bounce out of the division. They really, I think, this whole swipe right real quick on social media or swipe up, it's I need gratification right now. I need, I need that self-gratification right now. What can I have in front of me? I already kind of beat some of the guys that rank number five, number six. I've already beat number one, you know, number two to get to the title or to win the title. Now I want what's next. What can you give me that's even bigger? And I think what you're seeing from some of the guys, the older guys, I think should be allowed to have that feeling. Like guys like Dustin Poirier, he needs fights right now in his career that motivate him. But these younger guys like Ilya Taporia going, oh, yeah, I'm going to fight so-and-so up here. I'm going to fight. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you haven't defended it one time. You beat a guy who's coming off of a head kick knockout. Like, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's, how about we defend this Max fight I'm really excited for, even though I thought Max should have stayed at 55. But that being said, yeah. you know, like but I, my take Look, on, he agrees with you. You know, I agree. I, I'm just simply saying, like, Max has done everything he needed to do at 45. Ilya Tapori needs to clear out that division. He's fought a lot of guys in there, but there's still a lot of guys there for him to fight. He shouldn't be even mentioning that. UFC shouldn't be entertaining that going there. This is that whole, I think, social media, swipe right, swipe left, up, down, real fast. I need self-gratification right now. That's what they're looking for. What can I do to make me the most money? I will say this, though, in defense of Taporia. I mean, you know, I've been around long enough uh, where, you know, how do I say this? Fighters say lots of things. They say lots of things. <laughs> Not in the always end, the question is, say, yeah. in the end, the question is, what do they do? And so you're right. Like, Taporia, Taporia has not done himself. It, it's weird. If you look at, like, my Spanish is not good. It's something I work on all the time. But I could do enough of it to, like, you know, watch or read interviews or whatever. And his Spanish interviews, like, he comes off completely different than he does in English. English, he comes off really quite poorly to the audience. Mm. Uh, and they don't like him. But here's my here's my response to that is, like, he still took the Max fight, which – to our benefit, I cannot wait. I mean, like you, yeah. that's the best fight MMA can make right now. Yes. It's the very, it's the very best one. And he's electric in the cage. So I kind of just like, you know, I just kind of shut it off and then just wait to see what actually happens. And then he took the fight. But I, I grant that like getting out there and, and Drickus, I don't think is as bad because, you know, he's still fighting all these guys and mm -hmm. he's going to stay at 185. And Poet Tom was even like, I'll go to 85, which I, I'm totally against. But I do agree. It's also the Conor McGregor thing. Like, oh, you know, two belts, holding them both up at the same yeah. time and that kind of thing. They but really Conor want... never defended one of them. <laughs> I know, which is sort of like appropriate, right? Like all these guys yeah. not defending the title being like, I want it's two exactly of exactly what you're instead. talking about. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah, they, they want they want the two belts. They want, but that's that was another argument for myself, though, for Max was to stay at 55 was because he's already done everything he's needed to do at 45. Sure, going down to beat Ilya Taporia, but that's a newer generation. He is He's not old at all. Max is not. But there's more to be said and done, I think, at the 55-pound division for him. And the fact that he put the weight in properly and he looks so good against Justin Gaethje, why not stay and see if you can get it done against somebody who a lot of people think is the number one pound for pound in Islam Makachev? Can you stop the takedowns? Can you get it from the bottom? Can you use your boxing? Because everyone talks about the one thing that if you're going to say Islam has a weakness would be if someone could get him to, to stuff takedowns, if they could stop his takedowns, on the feet he can be exposed. I spoke to uh, Ivan Flores, who is the one of the striking coaches of Max Holloway, and this was just after he had knocked out Justin Gaethje. And I had asked him, like, it looks to me like in the last few fights we've really seen Max be, even at 45, obviously, before that, 
you know, a little bit more heavy handed, like the punches seemed to be landing with more authority. And he told me that was exactly something that they had worked on. Obviously, it was aided by the fact that he had gone up 255 pounds at this point. And I was with you. It's like, don't get me wrong. Again, like Max versus Ilya, I'm not going to complain about it under no. any circumstance. But if you're Max and you're going 45 and you're working on your power, then you go to 55 and you have results like that. Then you want to go right back down to 45 again. I don't know how that's going to go. Yeah. I don't know. It could be could be just fine, right? But at the same time, it's like manipulating your body this way when you had kind of peaked at, th at 300 to deliver and lower the boom on a guy like that. I thought was extremely impressive. Defend the BMF title up there. You could always take a fight with Ilya, I think, later, given his like legacy at 45. Um, we shall see. In the end, if he wins, then there's going to be egg on all of our faces, of course. But I was with you. I thought that like another fight at 55, at least, would have given us a little bit more of a barometer of how like good that could have been for him. If you're looking to do MMA bets, there is no one better than BetUS. I'm telling you right now, they are fantastic. The odds are great. And right now, if you use our promo code of YouTube150, you will get 150% on top of what you put in up to $2,000. And if you do it and you add more money later on, it's 125%. So they even add on top of it. BetUS is the very best when it comes to MMA gambling. If you want to make a bet on a fight, you know a fighter is going to win. I'm telling you right now, go to BetUS, use that code YouTube150, and you'll get that 150% on top of what you put down. You can also use them for NFL, NBA, any of the sports that are available on BetUS. YouTube 150 is your promo code. 150% bonus on your first deposit. 125% bonus on your next two deposits. Don't miss out. Go to BetUS. It's crazy. Yeah, but if, and this is my, my, Josh and I have argued this back and forth, and I agree with the weight thing. Yeah. But if you're max and you're sitting there talking and you're saying, okay, we're going to give you another fight at lightweight, it's not going to be Makachev. I'm going to give you another fight. Or I can give you a title fight against Tapuria. Why would you not take the title fight? What's going to put you back in that position? And 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 second off, if you look at it, if you were in Max's corner and I said, hey, I'm going to give your guy a fight. I'll give you either Ilya Tapuria or I'll give you Islam Makashev. Which one would you take? Well, it depends what he wants. I think yeah. he well, but the whole titles? point is which, which one does your guy match up with better? He matches up with Tapuria better. We'll see about that. Well, they, we are. But if you're going to say if if there's a way to beat Max, it's what? Get him off of his feet and take away all of those skills that he has that he's beautiful with. And it's not easy to take him off his feet. But that's what Makachev, you know, that's his game. And so I look and say, that's not a great matchup for Max. That's a tough matchup. I not that Tapuria is not a tough matchup. Yeah. But Makachev and his style is, hey, I'm going to take you to the ground. I'll stand with you for a while, but I'm going to take you to the ground. You know it's coming. But Tapuria will actually, he'll just stand and bang with you, even though he's got a great ground game. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's right. Like, obviously, black belt in jiu-jitsu, and uh, you saw what he did to Bryce Mitchell. That was, like, a little hard oh. to watch, you know? Uh, the thing is this, like, I in that same interview with Ivan Flores, I asked him, like, what went wrong in that third Volkanovsky fight? Like, if you could pinpoint, and his answer was, you know, a couple things, but... The biggest one was that they were much better at being first and third, right? Throwing something out, getting response, and then countering him on the yeah. third of the exchanges. Mm -hmm. And they just couldn't get they couldn't get him out of that rhythm. And it's like, I don't think that Taporia is going to follow that kind of a game plan because remember, uh, Max was the one leading and it was Volkanovsky kind of like, you know, on the outside. I don't I, yeah. I just don't think that Taporia is gonna fight that way. But I do think that Taporia has the ability to box with him and, and I, th oh, I he think does. he does have superior firepower also the thing i'd say is i wouldn't predict that max would stuff all of makachev's takedowns that's that's really not what i'm saying i will say this though i think max's takedown defense is excellent mm -hmm. it is very good it He's is hard I'm to not, take down. I, I i totally agree with you but i look at you know I, i've seen a lot of guys and this is the whole habib factor and this is islam islam is you know he's a not a carbon copy of, of habib but he follows the same blueprint and you look and you go you know it's coming and I want you to tell me who's the guy that has really stopped it. Uh, Armin gave him a little bit of trouble. Armin gave and him Armin trouble. is how good of a wrestler? Yeah, he's f ridiculous. Like, okay. He can scramble his in, ass. In all and defense that's, in that's that fight, though, Islam was coming off of a staph infection and getting, he was still on meds for that fight. So that yeah. was also one. Armin Armin's yeah. UFC debut. I mean, it yes, it, exactly. it goes both ways. Yeah. True. Yeah, True. It absolutely. does go both ways. I, but look, Armand, look at uh, Diego Lopes had a really good debut, even though he ended up coming up short against Evalov. 
And I thought Armand had a very great debut. Look, when you come in kind of sometimes on short notice and it's your debut, there's less pressure too. Like this is the guy that everyone thinks I, I can just go out there and be me. Like no one's really expecting me to beat this guy. This guy's could be Habib's, you know, best friend and training partner and this and that comes from a world renowned gym. No one's expecting me to beat him. And that's mm. kind of where I think that's where he was able to fight as free as possible. There's a lot more pressure on the line now if it's going to be for the title next. Anyways, I, I don't want to get too far. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just say lastly, I, I think the good news for Max is that he's got options. And yeah. I think he's competitive in a lot of different places. My only hope is that win or lose, he doesn't take a beating uh, against Taporia because I want to see what he can do if he wants to go back up to 55. That's it. See, I, 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 when I, we have one more last thing. <laughs> is that when I look at this fight, I think Max is going to win this fight. And I think I don't want to say it's going to look easy, but I think it's going to be a lot easier than people think it's going to be for him. His, his speed, okay. his movement. Taporia is someone that's going to walk forward. And he's just going to try to land the big shots. And he may try to wrestle a little bit, but I think he's going to try to outbox him because he's been talking so much trash about how I'm the best <laughs> boxer. I'm the better boxer. Max can't that handle this, can't handle that. Well, I mean, I put my own foot in my mouth and I said, Justin Gage, he's not a technician when it comes to boxing. He's not an Ilya Taporia in that style, but he normally can take a, a hell of a shot. And he's got a lot of power. And if Max Holloway could take that power from Justin Gaethje and make him miss and make him pay like he did, he could probably do the same exact thing to Ilya Taporia. The speed concerns me a tiny bit because inside that phone booth, Taporia will have the, a very similar speed advantage or similar in speed to him. So Max got to have to keep it on the outside and use his footwork and pepper him with the jab, frustrate him, make him reach and make him pay. And that's the way I think that Max gets it done. But I think Max can win this fight. I can't wait to see it. Either yeah. way, it's going to be a hell of a contest. I guess to go back to the Alex Pahea fight and the Khalil Roundtree fight, a lot of people were just talking about the power of uh, Khalil. A lot of people were talking, obviously, the fact that he is Southpaw, the fact that it's going to be a little bit harder for him to land. But then you go back and you look. Uh, I believe um, uh, Hill was also a Southpaw. Somebody else that he had fought was a mm -hmm. Southpaw. Uh, Izzy switches left and right, dealing with that. Take so it away. Yuri, that, Yuri switches as switches well. left, you know, left and right. His ability to time the left hook and land it. That is his MO. Khalil Roundtree also, John pointed this out the other day, stands directly in front of his opponents and likes to throw down. That could be a big problem for him. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, okay, you're going to have open stance, so they're going to be hand fighting on that same side. That's going to make some kinds of things complicated for Poetan, but it's nothing he didn't see in glory or, to yeah. your point, with other opponents. Also, like when someone does that, and to your point, like how do you throw power? You have to be, you have to be rooted to the ground. I think that the leg kick, the the the, the step up leg kick for him is mm -hmm. going to be for Poetan is going to be big. The front the the front kick up the middle is going to be big for him. And he's real good about making guys reach. And when they reach, he uh, look at how he stopped poets. Excuse me, look how he nice stopped Gary with the left hook yeah. when he was backing up, and then popped him when he was trying to extend on it. So it's like, again, like are there ways that Khalil could win? For sure, for sure. It's just you, you like, what's the one thing you can point to with Khalil that's like the dominant factor for him? Well, like, John, I'm not, John, I'm not exactly sure that I see it. John kind of thinks he, that Khalil will probably be a little bit more of the faster, more explosive fighter. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, okay, fair enough. He probably has faster hand speed. He's just going to throw yeah. with more regular intensity. I mm -hmm. think that's probably, uh, which makes the danger element certainly significant. Uh, it's just you know the uh, when you so it, fights don't always go this way, but when you sort of tally up the skills chart there and like who's got what, it's a it's an uphill climb. I yeah. think doable oh, for a good round but an uphill climb. I would agree. Okay. Um, if I go ahead and roll you on down to Juliana Pena and Raquel Pennington, you know, there's been a lot of just back and forth and Juliana is probably the best in the game and getting under people's skin in terms of the women. You know, I mean, obviously it was Connor before She's a talker. Some, uh, she can talk <laughs> though. She can really stoke the fire. Her, dude, her words burn. But what there was something she said that, you know, Raquel, what she's doing is she's not doing like the 24 seven. She's not willing to like do things to really put the women's MMA at the forefront. And the UFC is looking for people like myself. She's talking about herself, Juliana Pena, to put them at the forefront. How much of that is a factor when you think that the UFC is looking for their fighters to promote? I think certainly in the case of that division, it's significant would not even be the word. I mean, yeah. I, I try to be, I want to be as like fair and as uh, understanding as I can, but I, 
I also believe that you have to look at the state of not so much women's 125, but certainly women's 135. And I would more broadly say the game in general, but in particular that division, it's it's declined in stature. Uh, okay. It's declined, I think, in technical development to a degree as well. And I do believe that there are some places for optimism. Kayla Harrison's also on this card. I think, you know, 135s are... I cannot believe she makes it, but she looked amazing. <laughs> I don't think Holiday. she believes she made it <laughs> the first I, I, time. You guys have seen her in person, obviously. Yeah. I've had her oh, in yeah. studio a couple times. I, I, when they said she was going to make 135, I was like, there's no fucking way. Yeah, that's like, what there's I said. no way. And that's what did. I said. It's, and then uh, she, she made it look easy. I, I couldn't believe it. So credit to her. But the point I wanted to make was, you know, Juliana is here because, okay, she's got the win over Amanda Nunes, but has been off for quite some time. But, like, it's not hard to understand why she's here. You've got someone in Raquel Pennington who – we should not lose sight of the fact that, like, remember, she didn't want to go out for the fifth round against her fight against Amanda Nunes. Her coach kind of cajoled her into it. She goes out there. She gets blasted. It was a big controversy. But it ended poorly for her, I think, is a, is a fair way to put it. Then she had, like, you know, a series of accidents and medical mishaps. And then she just kind of climbed her way back to this spot. Like, credit to her. She's really not even supposed to be in this particular spot right True. now. And she earned it the hard way, like, you know, nickel and diming it all the way through. And I say that in a complimentary way. But she doesn't appear to be a trans, like a, uh, a trend. She, she, she appears to be a transitional figure in, in the division in terms of championship status. Mm -hmm. And it's still very difficult to win a title. So the point I'm trying to make is like they picked Pena quite obviously because she's going to inject a little life into this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then here comes Kayla Harrison. I think they're obviously yeah. trying to set up a Pena Harrison contest because then you get something with a little bit of like electricity to it. Yeah. And I, I, I get it. Like all the criticisms you can make of UFC, this appears to be one that you could not. And, you know, I don't, Pennington has a right to conduct her career the way that she feels mm -hmm. is best for her. And I, I accept that, but there are, there's no such thing as a free lunch. If you're not going to accept, you know, embedded or whoever into your camp, and you're not going to do the kinds of promotional things that otherwise champs would do, they're going to put you up against a talker who may not necessarily deserve it. And if you lose, you're not going to get a rematch. Like, that's yeah. just the, it's the John Fitch approach, right? The, you'll, the, okay, you'll get your title shot against GSP, but it's going to come real late. And if you lose and he lost badly, mm -hmm. that's that's the end that's of the it. line. We're for done. You. We're running through you. Yeah, I get it. My only concern with Raquel Pennington in this fight uh, is she's going to have to. She tends to slow down as the fight goes on. Juliana Pena will be there in the fourth and fifth round. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, Raquel, Raquel Pennington tends to sometimes not get after the fight. She she lets the fight get away she holds from her. Back. When she doesn't let her hands lets go her times. hands go, these women fear her every time she touches them. She just chooses not to let them go enough. Now, I don't know if that's from fatigue. I don't know if that's just from not wanting to overextend herself and getting taken down, having to work to get back up. But the last thing and the third knock I'm going to have on her right now is she is fighting on the same card as her wife. Why would you do that to yourselves? Hmm. Your emotions go this way and that way, even when your wife is not fighting. And then now you're in the back warming up. She wins or she loses. Let's say she wins. I'm on cloud nine. Every fighter in the back is trying to relax. They're trying to rest. They're trying to get a nap maybe before. They've got their music on, listening to music, you know, getting their, their mind right. She will be in the back watching her wife fight before she goes out there and defends her title. I didn't think that was a very smart thing to do. I stopped trying to fight on the same cards as my, as my teammates with DC and with Rockhold and with anybody else because I would get stressed out, man. I was always kind of either right above them or right below them or in the mix. And it was just this, man, they're warming up. I'm warming up. We were always in the same locker room. If that your teammate comes back all beat up, you're like, damn, man, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. You got to get your mind right again. Your emotions run up and down. I don't think that's, I think it was ill-advised that they decided to fight on the same card. I don't get it. I don't, I mean, that's obviously a, an experience I can't speak to, but I certainly recognize like how distracting or otherwise altering of the peace you're trying to establish yeah. before a fight. I guess, you know, if there is one thing you can say for Raquel, she is extremely experienced. You know, this is not somebody who's wet behind the ears. She yeah. really knows she's been in there and, and these, you know, these kind of like slower kind of grindy affairs as well but i recognize like that is a grenade you're rolling into the room and you know yeah. god only knows what's going to happen when it goes off you know uh for both of you guys the, the fight that i'm most looking forward to is uh jose aldo only because he's jose aldo and i think we continue <laughs> to forget like how damn good he was for so long undefeated for i think 11 years or 10 years you know and then obviously losing to connor but then 
just that that whole thing. People were talking about him going to 55 to challenge for the title. And then he ends up going back, then he ends up going to 35 instead because he realized how big the guys at 55 were when he decided they wanted to go there. Is there was all that buzz for a while. Now at 35, Batista being a scrappy, just a dog in there and can be able to take, you know, be able to take shot, give shots. But Jose Aldo with the experience, I'm excited to watch him because I feel like he left. You know, now he's back. He seems rejuvenated. He wants to make another run. He's made it very public about it. He's 38 years old. Can he do it? Do you think he'll have success this Saturday? Man, you want to talk about a guy whose resume has aged really well? Uh, it's just, it, there's, we've lived through a few guys who were ahead of the game. Like they were clearly ahead of their peers. BJ Penn at his best was just that. Yeah. BJ Penn separated his rib. Uh, John, I don't know if you were reffing this fight, but I was. When, he, when he fought Hughes Matt the second Hughes. time, second and he hit time. him with octopus guard. UFC Craig, 63. Yeah, Craig Jones is bringing octopus guard back in 2024. <laughs> That's right. right. It's just like fucking like, what? You know? Yep. Um, you can't believe it. So there's that, and I think him in terms of takedown defense, but a lot of things has just been really, really, really ahead of the curve. Another guy, by the way, going to 35, I was like, oh, there's no way he can do it. And then, you like, what? Like, yeah. he is doing great. Batista is aggressive. He's in your face, but he's very bouncy and he does a lot of lunging. And so the thing for me is like you've seen Aldo really good at pivoting out, uh, anticipating strikes, good with uh, movement when he has to be. He can plant that, accept it, and then you know get out of the way of it. And I feel like unless unless Aldo's thirty eight really catches up with him, which it might, but if it doesn't, this is kind of his fight to lose. Mm -hmm. Which you just also is like. Oh my God, he's still out here. Like potentially, we'll see what happens. But potentially beating like top ten contenders at age thirty eight in division he was never supposed to be in in twenty twenty four. Like it's absolutely shocking. But I just feel like he's got you know at the end of the day, at the end of the day, more often than not, skills win fights. And I feel like while he doesn't have the youthful advantage and probably not the overall physical advantages of Bautista, he's got a pretty significant skill advantage. And unless the physical deterioration has worn that away, he should be able to get the W here. Yeah, I, I the one thing I look at when it comes to that fight though, it, when you look at Jose Aldo, there, yes, he got knocked out by Connor. Okay, that was thirteen seconds. Happens. He that was one. I think emotions was the big thing, and he did lunge in. You can take a look at his fight against Peter Yan. That's one that you go, okay, he took a lot of damage yes. in that in that fight. But from that point, he's come back, and and when he he was coming back to fight at one thirty five against Jonathan Martinez, I was like, man, this is this is going to really show. A lot as far as has he gotten to that point where the age is now caught up. Oh, it showed a lot. Right. Oh, it did. You know, it did. And it showed me, it really showed me as I look at it. Okay. Experience wise, there's no comparison between Batista and Aldo. And now, honestly, skill wise, he hasn't lost those skills. He hasn't lost the speed. He still has power. He doesn't kick like he used to. I, I don't know if there's an injury there that has made it where he slowed down on the kicks because his kicks used to just be devastating as far as how often he would go to them and how accurate and hard they were. But I look at this fight now and I go, man, at 38 years of age, unless he had a car accident that I don't know about just two weeks ago, Aldo, and he he's not the favorite. He's the underdog. Mm -hmm. I don't know how because I look at Aldo as – He's got too much in the experience field and too much as far as skills for Bautista to now overtake. I, I couldn't really disagree with that. If I'm if I'm trying to give Bautista like um you know, like where could he have some real um like what what would be a positive sign Success? for Success. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean if you look at his numbers, right? So I checked him before this conversation, he averages two point two five takedowns per fifteen minutes, so almost one around. Mm, However, the big exception to that is <laughs> That's that's insane, but like he, the big, he, he's not like the, the idea he's going to take down Aldo is like boom, yeah. like no, it's just simply no. not going to happen. However, the big improvement for him has been his last fight, Bautista against I think Ricky Simone. Yep, he got no takedowns in that and was still able to win pretty convincingly. So like obviously there's some maturation that's happening in his overall growth. Yep. It's just for a guy who's real bouncy, who's going side to side, that can confuse a lot of people. But I feel like. It doesn't get guys like Aldo. So we'll see at 38 if he's still got the physical tools. But if they're at all there, like we saw them relatively recently, 
again, it's going to be, I think, an up, something of an uphill climb for Bautista. Yeah, he doesn't need to get takedowns. I mean, he didn't need to get takedowns against Ricky Simone. Ricky Simone was going to probably try to shoot on him is what I would have Ricky imagine. Simone's not. Yeah, he's, he's, a good, not he's, he's got decent stand-up skills. They're not, there's nothing there that you yeah. look and go, ooh. The, the only thing I think is going to. Although you can look and go, ooh. We're going to find out in the beginning how this fight will end up going. And I think is Jose Aldo, if, he can, if he's able to come out and start utilizing his kicks. When he got away from his kicks is when he started having some some of his downfall. You know, the Peter Yawn fight didn't kick enough. As he went back to kicking his, a little bit more in some of his past fights after that, he had a lot more success. And I think if he kicks, if he's kicks two or three times around and they're able to land clean, it starts to change the way people fight him. They are afraid to lunge in. They are afraid to be too close. Their stance mm -hmm. shortens up. Their power they don't sit down on because they know if they put too much weight on their legs that he will expose their legs and he will dominate those legs. He will crush them. I don't know what it is about him and his leg kicks, whether he got it from soccer or not, but they do damage <laughs> every time they touch somebody and it makes them fight a different fight from that moment on. And, and especially so, a guy like Bautista, right, yeah. who is bouncing big, wide L steps all around the cage. I mean, you take that guy's wheels away, yeah. and he doesn't have an access to the takedown. That's a tough fight to win. That's yeah. a really yeah. tough fight to win. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. I was a betting man, I'd probably go with the dog, which Jose Aldo's the underdog in this fight. I just can't get away from the experience. If he, you see him come out and start kicking, I would try to go to the live odds and start betting right away. <laughs> That's what but I'll I would say this. Do. I mean, I'll say this. Like you know, uh, you guys know this too. Like. You, you, you can decide which of the divisions in MMA is the best, but certainly 135 is going oh, to be in that conversation. Right there. It's right there. Yeah. And, you know, we, I, we've seen the stat before, like no one at 155 pounds. This is not a title fight, so this is a, a different thing. But, you know, no one over the age of 35 has ever won uh, a title 155 and below. Dude, to be 38 at yeah. 135, I mean... Did you guys see they wheeled out Jimmy Carter for his 100th yes. birthday? It's yes. like, it's like, dude, you're getting to like that kind of 38 and 135. <laughs> at 135. Old. It yeah. old. It's old. Yeah. You it's can old. talk about 138 at heavyweight. Okay. No problem. Hey guys. Yeah. Hey guys. You know, I fought when I was 38. Calm down, guys. Calm down. Well, I'm just, <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying it's, it, it, was it as easy at 28? No, I mean, it, I, no, I would no, imagine no. that it was not, it was right? Not. So it was not. So to be fighting top 10 guys at 38 down a weight class from where you really made your bread and butter is yeah. if he wins again, yeah, yeah. it's just, insane because it's the really hardest insane. thing to do is to fight the guys with speed at that age like when you're right. going down those guys with speed are the ones that kill you every time it's not so much the power at the at the at the lower weight class it's when you start to get older you start to lose your speed and they're able to touch you a lot more and then mm. that starts getting frustrating for you because you're like damn it's the chris tucker thing which one of y'all hit me like you know you start looking <laughs> around because it, it, they seem so fast when you're in there it's real time these guys are at the peak of their of their careers and they're at the peak of their performance in their camps they show up to fight they're the fastest they're going to be and you you're slowing down and so it does get to you look i, I don't want to run through the whole car but uh is there another fight on here you wanted to chat about you obviously have kayla harrison and uh, kayla Vieira, kevin holland and delizzi and stephen thompson and buckley those are the next three fights in that mix any of those three that really interest you that you feel like would be a, you know good for the card yeah, I mean the the, the Kayla is a big time favorite. It seems Huge. like Minus she'll win. Yeah, it's, yeah, you know it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. The one I actually care about the most is, it, it, and it, not to say it's the best fight, or not even to say you're guaranteed to get action. I really don't mean that, but rather the Buckley and Wonder Boy fight to me is like the most kind of interesting puzzle piece yes. to get. Now, if you look at the last three fights that Thompson lost, I think it's Burns, uh, Bilal, and I forget who the other one was. It was like a oh, it was um. Another wrestler, I forget. Yeah. But the oh, Shavkat. Shavkat got him, I think, from the back. So, uh, or whatever the choke was. So, you know, guys who kind of put it on him in a grappling context. And we've seen certainly Buckley been able to do that. In fact, his last fight, that's exactly what he did. And and Wonderboy, 42. I yeah, know. Jesus, yep. 42. That is up there. Yep. So it seems like Buckley is set up to use some of that wrestling prowess. But I wonder to what extent in one of the bigger cages he's going to have the same ability to find Thompson. Does Thompson have a, a, a any other tricks left off his sleeve? You know, a guy who's been really evasive for the majority of his career, but at 42, what's to say? So a bit of an intriguing puzzle piece kind of matchup for me. I looked at it when every time I look at Steven Thompson, I look at him as alongside Lyoto Machida, uh, MVP, Michael Venom Page. And I think to myself, it doesn't matter who they're fighting. These people have never fought someone like him. And that's fighters can, you hear it so cliche, fighters go, oh, you've never fought anyone like me. No, no, actually everyone I've fought is just like you, okay? <laughs> but Steven Thompson, Lyoto Machida, and MVP, those three guys can say you've never fought someone like me because there's not many of them in the sport. 
And so and remember, I remember back in the day, this was a long time ago. I think it was like, I looked it up. I think it was like UFC 56. We'll, we'll remember Newton. it. It's okay. <laughs> Jeff Newton, the karate kid. Yeah, That's what, that was his nickname. One yeah. of these guys who had like a karate background, but wasn't nearly, and there's different kinds of karate, obviously, but yeah. it wasn't nearly as evasive, wasn't nearly as uh, capable of moving. Thompson is just so, again, 42, I, you know, had a couple of rough losses here, but in general, just presented a style of MMA where he really upped the game of everyone around him by virtue of like, how are you going to find this guy? How are you going to make this work? Really quite different in that regard. MVP obviously came along a little bit thereafter, but I give Thompson a lot of credit for, um, uniquely elevating the game a little bit in how different he was and what challenge that put to his contemporaries. Well, just remember, it was two fights ago that you had Kevin Holland going, he's so fast. Hmm. And he was 40 years old already. Right. You know, so I mean, like now you got Joaquin Buckley, who's going to for sure be the faster fighter. But can he use his speed and his, his ability to get in and out against someone who is just so not, he's just not hittable. That's what Steven Thompson's made his career off of is making sure that he makes you miss and stays slightly outside your range and just is always touching you and annoying you to the point where now what do you do? You lunge in into something that catches you and now you don't know what to do. It's he's out here like playing chess while you guys are playing checkers. You know, or or he gets you to back up into something that yeah. you didn't that you didn't anticipate. Like exactly. he's very clever with the range. Yeah, I, I definitely am extremely interested in that fight. You know, the Kevin Holland one is fun too because will the speed, will he be able to stop the takedowns? Will Delizzi even try to take, get a takedown? That kind of mm -hmm. thing. The Kayla Harrison, she's very highly favored. Um, but I just remember what the Kayla Harrison thing that people were talking about when she was in PFL. Oh, she's never fought anyone. She can't hang with anybody. And then comes over here and had a very dominant performance against Holly Holm. And I'm looking that she's going to probably have another dominant performance here against Caitlin Vieira as well. I mean, then it's, she pretty much fights for the winner, I would imagine, for the title. Yeah, and also, like, the fact that she can now use her elbows and other ground and pound tools, I think, transforms her ground game. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, she could always get the takedown, but now, like, she can just tear people to pieces, quite literally. So, I, again, fights are crazy, but she should win that one walking away. Well, that's our UFC pay-per-view talk for this show. But then also, too, I wanted to <laughs> kind of switch gears and go into something else for you. So, I know that uh, with the, the fighter, what's it called? Uh, the settlement going on, you were very passionate about like getting the fighters to be into like some sort of Ali act or some sort of union, something to do with the fighters union, something along those lines. There was a moment there where I saw, I believe you tweeted it or you got it. You did a video being, all right, man, I'm done with you guys. I'm, I'm done. I'm tired of fighting for you guys. <laughs> You've kind of <laughs> since rolled that back. You said, so, yeah. you know, look, I understand the frustration. I do. I've been part of it. I mean, I got to give you a, for instance, I fought Clay Guida. I was sponsored by Sprawl at the time. Remember the short company, Sprawl? Yep. They were paying me $15,000 to wear the shorts. Clay Guida goes to them and goes, hey, I'll wear all your stuff if you just make my banner. And I said, <laughs> and then they called me and go, hey, your opponent said he will do all of this. You know, if we just make his banner, can you work? Can you cut, cut us a deal? And I was like, no, we already signed the contracts. No, oh my God. that was it. You know what I mean? So that I understand like fighters will sometimes undercut each other, not knowing what's going on against everybody Everyone else. Does. But I understand what you're saying. What, what's your take now on this? The whole, the judge coming back going, Hey, you know, we're not going to take the settlement. I think it was 335, 335 wow. million. Now it's yeah. been raised up to 375 million. And have you heard anything in terms of where they're kind of at on that? You think this judge will take this on um, things that you have heard? What's your take on this whole thing? Well, I'm telling you right now, when I am outside working and it is blazing hot, the thing that has saved my life this summer is Element. I love Element as a product. We're talking about a product that puts electrolytes, magnesium, and salt back in your system so you can function at your very best. When we're talking about salt, a lot of people think it's not good for you. Well, that has been proven wrong. It is absolutely something you need. And the best part about Element is they use salt in a way that it actually tastes good. Stay salty, my friend, is a great line. And it's the absolute truth when it comes to Element as a drink. John uses Element out there on the farms. I give it to my kids when they're out there playing sports. Like my son, he's super active in lacrosse as well as soccer. It's good to give it to the kids, keep their bodies hydrated, keep their muscles hydrated. The sodium is good for them, especially in this hot weather here in Texas, as well as for you out there in Tennessee. But hey, if you guys have athletes in your family, make sure you keep them hydrated by using Element. Use our description down below. Use the link, sorry, in the descriptions down below. Yeah. Make sure you hit that link. 
and every purchase you guys make through our link, they'll send you a bonus product. Uh, That's what's so important, man. You got to use that link because you'll get extra product. It's free. You're getting freebies. Exactly. So make sure you guys use our link down below in the descriptions for that bonus package of product. Every purchase you guys make. So it's it's a little more than that, actually. Not the money. The money part. You were right. It's three seventy five million that they are now offering, um, which is it's it's weird, right? Because in terms of what the plaintiffs were initially, that's the fighters. In terms of what they were initially asking, this is a far cry from that. But if you actually look at like major antitrust settlements, it's one of the biggest ones in frankly like labor history. It's mm. significant. So there's a couple of different ways to view it. But the big change is not so much that they upped it by forty million. The big change is remember it's we call it the antitrust suit, but there's actually two suits together yes there is the kung lee case which kung is lee until 2010 cajun 2017 johnson. and then the cajun johnson case that's right well here is what they offered they didn't just offer 375 mil they offered the initial settlement was 335 mil for everything yes now it is not now it is 375 mil for just the kung lee case and the reason why that is significant is because the kung lee case ultimately before the settlement could only ever be a monetary settlement. Like there was no other outcome with that, basically, that they could have gotten other than whatever amount of money that they were going to come to. It's the Cajun Johnson case where they're going to look for what's called injunctive relief. Yes. And that is what is like, hey, I'll make something up. Contracts of the UFC can only be two years or, so, or whatever, something yeah. like that. Change to the way in which the business of MMA business is model. actually run. The the defendants in this case, the UFC said, we're going to split that. So we're not only going to give you more money. We're only going to focus in on the, the Lee case. We'll leave the Johnson case to be litigated in the future. That is a pretty significant change. Whether or not Judge Bulware will accept it is hard to know because he never really wrote down in like he never submitted it to the court. What he wanted. What? Why? Like, why did he reject the, yeah. the last settlement? He didn't say. So we're kind of like, well... What you're looking for, you know what I mean? We don't really know, but I do think that them splitting up that, and you know, again, it's a fairly modest increase, but it, it is one that changes it. But, but the point I've always made about all of this, man, is like, you know, so it's it's a complicated topic. But the thing I would just say is, I've been around long enough. There's not many guys quite like me who have been around since the early to mid 2000s who are still in the sport and now the early 2020s and you've watched careers come and go and then you watch what happens on the other side and Josh you know you I'm sure you've seen this as well where it's like dude a lot of these guys don't end up great or no. they certainly don't end up with what they should have ended up with you know given what they took in terms of brain damage given in terms of what they generated for their fights and it's like I, all I really want is for something, whether that is a union, whether mm -hmm. it is an Ali Acme extended to MMA, whether it is something that happens with this antitrust suit, something that just levels the playing field at least a little bit. I mean, I always try to explain this to people. People think boxing is broken, and I'm not here to tell you that it's not. But what I am here to say is boxing was broken on purpose. They broke it on purpose and that they did that so that no one entity could overtake the other one. And that does create friction and it does create, I think, some uh, fan resentment. And that's not great either. But at the same time, I was reading the, for example, I was reading the report from the expert witness yesterday um, for a video I was making where they were showing the margins of who gets what with Lou DiBella, one of boxing mm -hmm. promoter, with Bob Arrow, and boxing promoter, with Golden Boy. And all of them were 75% or more going to the boxers. Yeah. 75%. Yep. And maybe that's too much. Maybe that's also not the right formula. All I'm simply saying is, in boxing, you have federal legislation protecting the boxers at least a little bit. In MMA, you have no union, no legislation. You have no nothing. You have nothing. And I'm simply asking, like, does nobody else think this is fucked up? It just seems so manifestly absurd to me. That, and, and so it's just frustrating at times where I have to fight uh, other fans or even sometimes like to argue with other fighters being like, dude, this is not, yeah. this is not equitable to you. And, uh, you know, I, I backed off from that position a little bit, but at the time I was just very frustrated. <laughs> I, I'm I'm somebody who is not in favor of the Ali Act for the sport of MMA because it wasn't built the way that boxing was built. MMA was built off of hey, we're gonna have five or four on the main card, we're gonna have you know three to four on the prelims. You're gonna give you a full night of action packed fights. And when the way the UFC came about was the fights that were opening the show on the prelims were some of the best guys in the world. 
because I was one of those guys a couple of times and I was right. Whoa, number three whoa, whoa. Don't start <laughs> patting yourself. Well, hey, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I was right. You know, BJ Penn and uh, Joey Gilbert, those guys were kind of opening the show. You know, and you've got top world class guys in the beginning of when the UFC was taken over by the Fertitas. Those best guys were opening the prelims. And so that's how this whole sport grew to be what it was. If the guy that was opening the show was ranked number four in the world, that's not what's happening in boxing. So that's why I kind of stay away from the all the act situation. I do understand what people, why they use the all the act is so the champions could go and travel after they've, you know, done their thing. They can make more money. There could be a bidding war for them and, and, and get all the praise. I understand that. I do get that. But when you implement that too, it also takes away. Now the person at the top is always getting all the money and the people below are not making as much as well. Now that's similar to the case in the UFC. I do understand that. But I, I also look at it in a fighter's union, I feel, is the way to go. Giving mm. the fighters an opportunity to make more than 17% of the pie. Giving them to the 20%. And everyone's like, yeah, they should be making 50. Let's slow it down. Can we, can we get it to like 20% first or 22%? And then we'll slowly start upticking it as the profits grow for the promotion. Because I look at the UFC and I go, I'm sorry, but when I went there, I had neck injuries. I had some back injuries. I had shoulder injuries. And their insurance that they have now for the fighters paid for it. You know, and sure, you want to use that when it's a big deal. If I had a shoulder surgery, paid for it. 100% paid for it. Everything done, paid for. It. And so that was nice. Now, you don't go to them when you're sick and try to get your medication. You don't go to them. You have your own insurance for that, you know, and you hope that you do. Um, but my thought process on it is we need to have some sort of fighters union. And the only way to establish some sort of fighters union is you have the current champions, not the GSPs, not the John Joneses. You got to have a very current champion who is willing to say, hey, I will not fight until we at least establish some sort of fighters union for all the fighters that are going to come that are going to be fighting on these cards. And the reason why I know that it will work is if these fighters do it now, if these fighters are able to do that is because they know that the UFC is held captive by ESPN to have a certain amount of title fights every year, certain amount of shows every year. And if they join as a fighters union to just do it as champions, you take your say four champions or five champions that will not fight. Sure. They can create interim titles, but that will obviously stir up a huge fan base to go, look, I'm not buying that pay-per-view. I know it's not a championship fight. I know what the fighters are doing. That will stir up a lot of controversy in terms of the, the fan bases and all that. Like, no, they should get a little bit more of the pie. Let's slow it down, though, on the 50%. Let's get it to, like, 20, 21. I'm a little surprised. I, I mean, I, I agree with you certainly in spirit, which is, like, you know, what's the solution? Well, there's a few different ways you could go, yeah. right? You could go uh, Ali Ak to MMA. You could go – let's see Let's see what happens with this antitrust suit. Let's just, let's just see. Um, or the union. Um, but I would say, you know, in 2023, the – I don't know. I mean, the UFC made more money than every single MMA and boxing promoter combined combined agree combined i mean we're talking about like the ufc is very good about being like hey we're the biggest and we're the best and then when it's time to pay up they're like oh we're very poor no you're not no you're not you have a lot of money you have more money than literally everybody else other than turkey al Sheikh, who obviously is backed by a petrol state so like there's money to to be shared also like the other part too is you know, even if they didn't like, imagine they did nothing to change fighter pay, like it yeah. said exactly the same, but they said, okay, you get half of the upcoming television deal. Do you think this next television deal, this next broadcast deal they're going to have is going to be an absolute financial windfall. And yeah. in the NBA, the players get 49% of that. Just that alone, just that alone would change everyone's freaking life. Absolutely. With the who fights in the organization. But I might do I a comeback for was, that. Okay. Well, well, let me just finish the point if I may, which is, I, I, I'm not opposed to the union. I think that would be uh, a dramatic improvement on everyone's uh, uh, situation. Uh, however, the fighters have voted against it yes. routinely. Yeah. And that's the part that's just like, fellas, like, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's where some of the frustration comes from. That's because you don't have anybody. Fighting is, first off, it's a very uh, individual thing, and they're selfish. And it's, I'm not saying that in a bad way, but you have to be selfish right. to be that person. And to look and for them to say, I'm not going to be sitting out my career for somebody else. You know, I'm not going to be putting myself in the position where the UFC is now putting me on the bench and fighting somebody else because I'm working for this. It's so hard to bring because you're not part of that team atmosphere and everything. Yeah, you've got your your gym team and things like that. But when it's such an individual sport, you know, boxing truthfully doesn't have a union. You know, it has the Alley Act. 
but it doesn't have a union. And I, I personally don't think that the Alley Act works well within MMA. There's there's too many holes in it that, that people could exploit with the way MMA is right now. But you take a look and you go, there's no one. There's no Kurt Flood. There's no, no. guy that's going to step up and be that man. There's it, The windows are too short. And yeah. Yeah. so many guys are like, hey, listen, I've got this much amount of time to make money. That's it. I can't afford to sit yeah. out. That's why it's like, I don't really... I, I'm open to the idea that there could be a, a solution we haven't even thought of yet. My only hope is that folks can look around and be like, there is money to be shared and guys who get brain damage uh, for 10 years yeah. and generates, help generate significant profit deserve to have more of that given to them. I think it's a very basic and I think honestly, very fair premise totally on which to have a worldview. Yeah. I'm interested to see where they go. Like you said, with the new TV deal, because I believe from what I've understood so far, people are telling me it's not just going to be with the ESPN. There's going to be several entities that will end up uh, featuring the UFC, whether they'll have Dana White on one platform, Dana White uh, Contender Series on one platform, they'll have on another platform, they'll have the Tough Show on another platform, they'll have Pay Per View, another platform, they'll have Apex. Events. From what I understand, all of them will potentially be on different platforms or all one that is merging because that's what's going on right now with TV. You know, you've got Disney now buying a lot of things and other people now kind of other people folding their their stuff, whether it was Showtime, whether it's Viacom, whatever, whatever it is. People are folding up their their networks, uh, but we got into the Ali Act. Dana White talking about doing boxing. How does he get around this whole thing? You know, um, outside of it being in Abu Dhabi or Riyadh, where there is no Ali Act, we we make our own rules. We don't need to honor your rules. <laughs> oh, look at that! That was the first thing that you know when Josh and I started. I said, "Look, Ali Act only works in North America." Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, anywhere else you go by any rules you want. So, uh, mostly the one exception would be if they sign a deal with some fighter to represent them. And it's a contract that's backed by American law. Even mm -hmm. if they fought somewhere yes. else, the terms of that would be in for, okay. But short of that, yes. yes. Got it. Yeah. I think that they're going to act like the PBC does. The PBC is actually not the promoter, not, not certainly not on record. It's TGB promotions. I've covered enough of these through Showtime to know that. It's yeah. so, so, but they kind of act as like, the almost like the event uh planner and sponsor like coordinators yeah, yeah that's right so they set up like the television deal they set up the event sponsorships they set up all kinds of stuff and then help where the broadcast is going to go i think that the ufc or at least fight pass or some combo of that is going to be where they go because I, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't make sense it's like well we pay the fighters 20 percent. we're gonna sign a bunch of boxers and pay them 80 yes, percent like it just you can't do that. However, yeah. you can do a deal where it looks like Turkey wants to build like something of a, and I'm using the economic term here, a cartel mm -hmm. where a lot of the. I know it sounds like I'm saying like yeah. a drug lord. That's not what. Oh, well, I mean. there, there it goes right out the window. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean like you know, like like the, the yeah. drug lords of Mexico. Or we'll get down to the drug thing later. <laughs> but what I mean is uh, a, a small group essentially working together. So this would be Queensbury, Matchroom, uh, yes. Golden Boy, bringing their fighters together, staging them overseas, and then the UFC kind of acting as like the sort of clearinghouse for it all. Um, I don't know how that's all going to work. Although I have heard, by the way, that until this uh, antitrust thing is settled, they're not going to fully launch into it. So we'll see how that goes. But mm. yeah, I did hear that. I said it's coming next year. I think that look that they, they I think they've been trying to reach yeah. the settlement and then yeah. the judge keeps saying no no no. Yeah. Uh, we we shall see. We it, shall see. I mean but I I did hear from a pretty credible place that they were not super enthusiastic about moving forward. Isn't it kind of funny though that you <laughs> think people you thought would never potentially work together is Oscar De La Hoya, Dana White. I, I mean this whole thing I, may potentially put them me. all in the same Hold room. On. Hold on. Yeah, <laughs> and this is what the one thing and I, I've talked about this on our podcast and Josh, Josh and I have talked about, you know, when, when Lorenzo Fertitta first bought the UFC and he, he brought me out and we had dinner and he gave me this line that scared the shit out of me. And, it, you know, I'm sitting there with a guy that I know is, you know, he's a good businessman. He's, you know, well connected. But he said, he said, John, you need to understand. He goes, friendship is friendship and business is business. But friendship never beats business. And the one thing that, you know, you can take a look at like Vince McMahon who Dana really patterned himself after, you know, at the beginning and stuff, you know, Vince McMahon is a guy, I mean, he's had all kinds of enemies and everything, but he never allows his personal belief and his personal view about someone to overtake business. Mm. 
business, he has brought how many people back that he felt stabbed him in the back or did any of these things. Boom. If they're, if they're good for business, he's bringing them back. And I think Dana, no matter what he may, he's going to say, I don't like you, but I'll do business with you. Mm. Well, I think it's the. <laughs> I think it's made possible by the very generous checkbook yes, yes, of, yes. Uh, of Turkey, mm-hmm. of course. But uh, yeah, it is kind of funny. Like two guys who were absolutely loathed by one another, and here they are and together. I will say also, it kind of shows you something too, which we've known for a while. But like boxing's been a little bit up and down in 2024, but it was red hot in 2023. Oh yeah, and the reality is, I with think some Dana, great fights. I mean, I was dude, I was you, there. I got to cover for Showtime Spence Crawford. That was oh, a wow. religious experience. Oh my god! Let me yeah. tell you, that was insane. That's the best experience I've ever had at a fight live. Really, bar, bar none. Because wow. I was a big Spence guy. I believed in Bud Crawford, but I was a big Spence guy. Dude, and then big, for Bud to go out Bud there guy. and absolutely cut him to fish bait yeah, was yeah. it was mind blowing. But the point I'm trying yeah. to make is that was a twenty million dollar gate that had nothing to do with the Saudis, right? Yeah. So. They, they've looked around the UFC and realized, well, TKO, obviously, they've looked around and been like, you know what? There's some big-ass money oh, in some of these big huge. events in boxing. Why aren't we getting a cut of that? Yeah, I agree. Here they are. Hey, everyone, the Weighing In podcast was the very first podcast that ever had a relationship with OF, and our relationship was in trying to be, bring combat athletes and fans together. It has been working. We've got a ton of people who are on OF now, fighters that you can go, you can sign up with. You can ask them questions. You can look for techniques that they use. It is a fantastic system. If you are that person that wants that one-on-one interaction, OF is the easiest way for you to do it. Yeah, you guys, check out OnlyFans. Subscribe to us over there. It is free. We have continued our partnership with them, and we're going to be there for at least a couple more years. Well, that's the hopes. Ooh, yeah. And look, we're enjoying working with them. They are a great company in terms of also bringing other athletes on. They're working close with Formula One. They're working close with a lot of combat sports athletes. They just signed Billy Kemper. Billy Kemper is now on their platform. Also, giving awesome surfer. Surfy, amazing surfer. Giving extra information. If both of you guys don't know the background on OnlyFans, OnlyFans was originally started for for sports, for yeah. soccer players, the European soccer market, having coaches being able to sell their information to their closest fans or people that really were driven to try to be the best. This is what it was produced for. That's what we're going to be trying to do. We're providing the extra content over on OnlyFans. Make sure you guys subscribe to us over there. It is free. There will be some stuff that we charge for, but right now our pro- our page and all the content we put on there is free. So subscribe to us over there at OnlyFans. Yeah, I just, I'm interested to see how they are able to maneuver themselves around the Ali Act yeah, because if they do any shows in the North America, they're going to have to follow those rules. So how do you go about doing business with those world class boxers? Because I feel like what they're going to do is Turkey was pretty upset over the Canelo thing. He's going to try to leave him out on the island somewhere and try to take all the talent that he potentially could fight. And be like, hey, who Take else are you going to fight then? No one's going to pay you know, $80, $90, or $100 for your pay-per-view to fight Joe Blow anymore because I've got Dude, all the fighters. But here's okay, the red carpet to come my way. But here's the problem. And I, I, I really disliked Canelo's last fight. I didn't think like yeah. watching it, it was a bad fight. But like, dude... Edgar Berlanga had no business. I know. No, thank Canelo. you. Zero, thank you. none, I nothing. I it's kept insane. thinking guy, maybe he'd catch him, you know, a little bit, I make totally him respect good. him. I, Dude, Canelo was. has a legendary chin. He's got one of the best chins in boxing fucking history. Like, <laughs> Berlanga would have had to have had the miracle upon miracles to get yeah. something going. But the point I wanted to make was, like, I, 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 and I, I like Canelo a lot. Like, he's been very generous with his time with me in general. If he stopped today, he's an automatic Hall of Famer. But I fucking hated that fight. I didn't want him to yeah. do it. And then it did a $17 million gate and like well over 500,000 pay-per-view buys. Like it's not even true that you can, like he's going to fight a Joe Blow and no one's going to care. Plus the two guys, everyone wants him to fight David Morello Jr. And David Benavides. Benavides. They're both with a PBC who doesn't do business with the Saudis. So like that plan ain't going to work either, bro. Like Canelo and Gervonta, Gervonta Davis are still kind of on the outside looking in, but I don't think they mind. Yeah. I mean, look, if the money's there and they're able to make it to fight whoever until they get to those those fights against Batista or whoever else for them to make the big money fights, I get it. Sit on the outside. I just, I, John and I brought this up. You potentially could end up seeing them create like another live golf basically for boxing and be like, hey, yes. all you guys are going to be on an island. If you're not fighting for us, you're going to end up being stuck. And when they're, when you're done, nobody, we're going to take over. So you have Which one I or two. Say, of like, I'm happy to see, uh, like, like the rest of the fight fans of the world, I'm happy to see big fights made. I am a little, like, 
you know, about somebody trying to take over boxing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like whatever your intentions, good or otherwise, I feel like boxing can't save it, can't kill it. Just leave it there, kind of the way it is. You know, the way it is. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I have a question for you because you've had a you've had an interesting platform as far as the way you've looked at certain things and what you you've looked at with when it came to performance enhancing drugs. You have actually come out at a at a point and said, "Look, I think they should get rid of all testing." People should be able to, if you want to take something, you can take it. That's the only way that you're going to truly fix this problem is open it up to where people can do whatever they want. What's your, what's your stance on this and, and where is it that you came to that conclusion? So that's a, that's not quite my stance. Okay. It, Give it to me then. Well, it could be. So the answer is, <laughs> the, the answer is this, if it, it, it's a little bit of a complicated answer, but I'll simplify it as best as I possibly can, which is to say the following, I'm not actually opposed to drug testing. Um, what I am opposed to is the idea that it should be mandatory and, um, that one size fits all. So here's what I mean. I, when I, when I first encountered anti-doping, I thought like it was by definition, a great thing. And then I just began to sort of follow the, I, I actually, I ended up interviewing a lot of guys who've actually done academic study of it. There's some, there's some people out of Europe who've really looked into it. Um, and what you find is that it certainly has some effect, but it's not nearly as effective as people imagine it to be. And there's a bigger problem with it, which is that there is an inexorable trade-off you cannot get around it between having anti-doping and protecting the rights of athletes they are in conflict at a certain point and so you have to decide where you want those trade-offs to be do you want trade-offs to be on the athlete rights side or do you want trade-offs to be on the anti-doping side and my view is whatever the athletes and the various stakeholders in place want that's what should go so for example you look at professional strongman, the guys who are like these six nine, four hundred pound guys. The Brian Shaw's of the world. Exactly correct. Yeah, they all use performance enhancing drugs, and nobody cares. No. I got to tell you, neither do I. However, <laughs> and neither do I. Right. Yeah. Ha- however, <laughs> there might be other sports: swimming, boxing, MMA, where the athletes and the various, you know, the promoters, whoever, say, "Well, listen, we want to have some version of anti-doping involved." As long as all of the people have a say over it, I really don't care. So that's why, for me, VADA, the Voluntary Anti-Doping Association, is the best possible choice mm-hmm. because the guys sign up for it. There are some other uh, ways in which you can't get a title with WBC if you're not involved, but yeah. the basic thing is it put athlete choice back on the table. And that's, to me, the problem. The problem I had was USADA went through in a very heavy-handed way, ignoring the rights of athletes. They, they destroyed Tom Lawler's career for nothing, for nothing. And the problem I had was that there was no... He's not the only one. He's not the only one, but he was a big one. There was no recognition of the fact that athletes do, in fact, have rights. You have to protect them, and they will be in conflict with anti-doping. Come up with a policy that works for everybody, not just throwing down rules on top of a group that has no say over it whatsoever that that's where i come down but what do you do with the like in terms of like with combat sports steroid use could be extremely harmful to other other athletes but you just legalize it across the board though and be like hey if you guys use it you guys use it um i i think that well i mean this again this kind of gets to a complicated place but like let me just let me just say this, and it's something to mull over, because again, there's never a one size fits all answer. There, it really would depend. Like, so for example, one thing we would I think probably all agree on is like if you're uh, 18 or below, or you know below yeah. the age of 18, you should not be touching this stuff under any circumstance. Period. There is no situation under which that should be allowed. So like that, that's one kind of place where it's like you know I can I can get behind prohibition, but. I think one thing people have a yeah. I think one thing people have a really hard time accepting is that, and it takes a while for me to, it took me a while to get here too, but once you really get here, it it changes your whole worldview. The drugs are here. They are not going away. And there is nothing you can do to make them go away. What you have to do is find reasonable ways to mitigate the problem. And and that is a very different thing from saying hardcore anti-doping, you get out you one issue, you're out for four years or lifetime bans. If you really imposed lifetime bans, you would you would cripple the sport. Yeah. It would destroy it. 
And so you have to understand, like, it's not a pleasant thought. Like, I don't say it like, oh, it's so great. No. But the, we have unleashed unto the world these pharmaceutical compounds. You cannot, the toothpaste is out of the tube. You cannot rein it back in. You must control it as best you possibly can. Here, here's my one question when it comes to it, because this is where I have the problem. It's like when you talk about strongman or you talk about swimming or you talk about baseball or any of these sports where, yeah, people use them. And look at, you know, baseball went through its whole thing with a lot of use. Mm -hmm. And, but none of those people are combating each other. Yeah. When it comes to, you can say football if you want, hockey if you want, but especially fighting, the use of the steroid itself, does it? possibly bring up the percentage of someone doing irreparable harm to another person in that sport based upon the use of that performance enhancing drug. So this is a thought that I think we should take seriously. It's a very completely reasonable question. And the first answer I would give is there's really not been nearly enough studies done to help us understand exactly what the relationship is. But the point mm -hmm. I always make to people is USADA had a contract with the UFC for what, approximately six years, six whatever years? it was, some, yeah. some amount of time. And in that time, they never once demonstrated, in part because I think there is no way to demonstrate it, you had whatever the injury load, brain or you know cuts, uh, torn ACLs, whatever, whatever the injury load was before USADA got there and after USADA got there. And the health outcomes of the fighters did not improve at all. Okay. So if the argument is, well, if you're, if you are trying to control for these things, there surely should be some measurable effect that it has in terms of the injury load and injury outcome. And there was nothing, there was nothing. It didn't show up in the data to the best of my knowledge at all. So it's not that I think that the question is unfair or that I have a firm hardcore answer, but rather with the available evidence that we have, we can't detect in terms of the injury load whether or not anti-doping is actually having any kind of perceived effect. Interesting, interesting. All right, buddy. Hey, man, I know we got to get you out of here, but I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It means a lot to me. And uh, honestly, I want to try to make this a regular thing, man. I love picking your brain. I listen to you guys over at uh, Morning Combat all the time. I want to get BC on as well. So I'd love to have you on again. Well, I appreciate you guys having me, Always. Josh. It was an honor to cover your career, and thank you're you. doing great things. Obviously, Big John, a legend in the game. So thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm uh, ladies and gentlemen, the very best when it comes to journalism in MMA and a guy that is too smart for me, Mr. <laughs> Luke Thomas.